Hello, Internet. I was recently given the chance to uh, give a guest lecture in a Hegel course at a university, and I thought I'd share it here as well, For so some of you might find it beneficial when you're working your way through Hegel. So I start with uh, a little bit about how I interpret Hegel's science of logic in relation to the question of ontology and metaphysics. So there are likely as many interpretations of this as there are Hegel scholars. I think the key questions can be boiled down to just this one. Does Hegel's logic tell us something about reality, about being, or does it tell us something about mind, how thought thinks? If the logic addresses simply reality and being, then it becomes a pre-Kantian or a pre-critical project a traditional metaphysical account, similar to Spinoza's. The advantage of this position is that reality, whatever it is, takes center stage and philosophy is here occupied with knowing what is. The disadvantage, however, is that it makes secondary our very knowing of what is. Our comprehension or account giving does not seem essential to reality and could have been done away with without diminishing the fullness of being. Mind, as in our minds, necessarily need the divine being, but the same does not hold the other way around. A potential worry with this pre-critical position is that it is vulnerable to skeptical assaults. Why should reality, as it is described in traditional metaphysical metaphysics, be right? How does it do any work on things around us? Why is it not just an elaborate construction by minds which consequently doesn't really have a grasp on reality and so doesn't really have any, any effect whatsoever? On the other hand, if the logic addresses mind and how thought thinks first, the advantage is that it integrates our account giving and additionally takes on board the skeptical worries. It focuses on mind as such, and looks at how knowledge is made, putting first the form of thinking before the contents. Or it shows how the content of thought and knowledge are always filtered in a certain way peculiar to mind. And especially peculiar to our minds. However, the disadvantage also follows suit. Being, whatever it is, is here turned into a divided and fractured reality. Something appears to us through our conceptual apparatus that makes possible our experience uh, of anything and consequently any possible valid knowledge we could have. However, we cannot help ourselves in positing that there is something beyond this appearance, a thing in itself of which we can never really know. So we are barred from saying anything about reality as such. The problem deepens when it is recognized that this very divide must itself be logically located somewhere. Is it part of being to divide itself into unknowable being and knowable appearances filtered through mind? Or is it strictly within the mind to disrupt itself in this way? Since the first question lays claim on being, this must be discarded within this position. And we are left with an, and so we are left with the other option, which is kind of like an internal rupture within the mind. So what started out as an appeasement to the skeptic turned into a wholesale skeptical ambiguity. We cannot but take for granted both the intuitions that present sensuous matter to a mind, as well as the logic that governs our very comprehension of that sensuous matter. So, I can make out an object of, let's say, you know, this, this glass, but I cannot know anything about it, what it really is apart from my experience of it, nor can I really know how the conceptual structures that mediate this as an object for me are coherently grounded. So, we become like a hybrid creature suspended between the beast and the divine, never really knowing truly the reality of either. So we're alienated both from being and from mind. Hegel is acutely aware of the insights and pitfalls of both of these positions. 
but he also notes the development between them, particularly how the subject becomes crucial in the second position. Being, whatever it is, must include thinking beings which can think being as distinct from them, and, likewise, thought, whatever that is, cannot be divorced from genuinely determining something real about being and itself. So the forward development, then, cannot be a mere reduction of being and thought into a simple identity, as in pre-critical pre metaphysics, nor can it result in the permanently fractured difference of being and thought, as, critical, as in critical philosophy. The filter of mind must itself be part of being, and not something that stands entirely outside it. Like, uh, you know, some forsaken dualism. Likewise, what being really is cannot be entirely indifferent to its account giving. That is, how it is determined by subjects in the discursive descriptions and determination. Indeed, ultimately, the fullness of being does not take place without our thinking of it, just as our thinking is not to be seen as wholly apart from the development of reality as such. The method, furnished by Hegel, becomes then to radicalize the skeptical position. In philosophical thinking, following Hegel, we do not presume a fundamental difference between being and thought, for the idea is, if this difference occurs, then it must logically occur within being itself. But we do not fall back into the pre-critical metaphysic, metaphysical position, precisely because the account-giving and self-critical methodology is built into the development. Indeed, it is built in to the point where the, skeptic the skepticism is not external to the contents of investigation, but imminent to them. So, thought here is thinking, 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 as Pippin has put it, such that what thought thinks is itself as its own subject matter in a difference that is not really a difference but still a difference in light of distinguishing itself from itself. But let us slow it down. The difficulty is that this radicalized skepticism is supremely abstract. In Hegel's story, what we usually call, ab call abstract doesn't really apply here, but leave that aside. So we're not standing at the end of the development, but at the beginning. And so we need a little bit of help. I've tried to show how the difference of being and thought plays out with pre-critical and crit the critical positions. But these are more negative preparations rather than positive. So let me try to say what I think goes on in the logic in a more positive way, and then we'll go and in, get into the contents of what I wanted to talk about. Just a disclaimer, I'm painting a very, very crude picture here of, you know, the pre uh, critical philosophies and then Kant himself so I'm just giving a very rough picture that is supposed to ease our understanding in uh, the kind of problem problems that animate uh, Hegel's philosophy so I'm, I'm aware that I'm not doing justice here to Spinoza or Kant and there is much more um, going on there but for the sake of this um, lecture I'm just giving a much more crude picture, but hopefully um, that still gets at the problems. So, the science of logic traces the development of being in a way that does not initially presume there is a difference between thought and being. What being turns out to be, and turns out to be discursively, is something that must be thought to be logically internal to being. Being becomes posited or more precisely being posits itself, in terms of distinctions, categories, or thought determinations. So scholars eternally argue over the exact nature of these categories. Are they really determinations of being, or merely determinations of being as thought by pure thinking? <laughs> One view holds that they are really primarily internal to being itself, and thus form part of its ontological development. So this is a view by Holgate whereas another view sees it more as a development internal to mind of which being forms a moment. So, scholars like Maker and Winfield. A third view, uh, which I've seen uh, by its own, 
sees Hegel's logic as a systematic account of conceptual thought, or the concept, such that the concept is the descriptive framework of being, which refers to things in being, but is not those things in themselves. For example, there are given things. Those given things always already stand in reference to some concept. Uh, some concepts are about those concepts, uh, which are about given things. These become the ontological concepts, which structure our conceptualization of what is. Others refer to the concept in its given use, not in its use to understand what is. So this makes it so that the logic is not about what is in any substantial sense, but about the aboutness of the world. That is, it is about the concept that governs concepts and their reference to what is. In other words, the logic is about the concept of concepts of th about things, not about the concept of things directly. Whichever interpretation here is most persuasive, it must deal with the two positions I outlined at the start. How do we understand the relation of being and thought without emphasizing one at the expense of the other? That is, simply undercutting their difference or falling into an insoluble dualism. So, let's move into the logic proper now. I want to talk about Hegel's account of necessity and a bit about the concept and then freedom. So, we'll warm up with an example. A lion is on the prowl to fetch its meal for the day, and spots a gazelle. As the big cat comes close and is about to spring its ambush, the gazelle notices the predator just in time and sets into evasive maneuvers. The gazelle takes a mighty leap into the air before charging off. But, curiously, the predator does not pursue. What has happened? The big jump the gazelle performs, technically has a name called stotting, takes up a lot of energy and does not take the animal as far away as if it just as if it, if it would just start to run immediately. So it is as if the gazelle leaps effortlessly to the air to tell the predator, look, see how easy it is for me to escape from you. You don't stand a chance. Don't even bother trying. And perhaps surprisingly, the predator falls for the trick. It is demoralized and ends its pursuit then and there. The ploy by the gazelle worked. But did the gazelle know what it was doing? Did the gazelle enter into a calculation of its options as it spotted the predator and started imagining certain possible worlds? Seems unlikely. Why posit these assumptions when we can just say that the gazelle just did it. Well, what the gazelle did was smart. And how can it do something clever without being aware of it? You know, this, you know, just as an aside, this can apply even to us. Our digestion is doing very sophisticated things, but it doesn't require us to know uh, what it is doing in order to do what it is doing. Indeed, that would be very cumbersome, I think. Daniel Dennett says the gazelle is the beneficiary of a free-floating rationale. Reason is part of the fabric of its existence, as it were. And the gazelle, just by virtue of doing what it did, unlocked this rational capacity. It's like the lion and the gazelle participate in a rational, non-contingent arm race between predator and prey, where each creatively brings about new tactics and tricks to outsmart the other. Without this rationality, natural evolution wouldn't make much sense. Animals creatively figure out new ways to protect themselves, find food, and generally maximize their lounging. But if this activity is not contingent, does it mean it's necessary? Did the gazelle make the giant leap, the stotting, because it was always meant to do that? Does the stutting work by necessity? It seems to us that once the action has taken place, it is as if it was always meant to take place. It is rational, so why not? 
how are we to think about necessity here? In his logic, Hegel offers us a way to think about necessity which avoids the fatalistic package. That is, a sense of things that were predestined. But how does Hegel do this? First, we need a rough map of the logical terrain we're about to enter. Hegel's world of pure logic is vast and intricate, and it, but it has three, three major dimensions, being, essence, and concept. So, to help our understanding, we can imagine that these constitute a mountain which we have to traverse. Now, our minds have naturally have wings, and we can skip to anywhere on the mountain. But if we want to learn the various paths of the mountain properly, we need to descend and walk the path with our own feet. Notice that when we are grounded, we cannot make leaps, but we must follow the course step by step. This is precisely how Hegel works out his conceptual dialectic. We cannot skip steps. The move from one category to another should be as obvious as placing one stone on top of another to form a scale upon which we can climb upwards. And therefore, the beginning must be something primitive and simple. Pure being is the most primitive notion we can think. It is like the very bottom of the mountain. In fact, it is just by the shore. It is our entry into this new exotic land of logic. Pure logic. But pure being turns out to include a whole lot of ever more complex and mediated structures. Indeed, being turns itself into a sublated moment, showing that more sophisticated processes are at work in being, which the logic of being alone cannot explain. So, in a sense, being is unable to just be. The beginning of the logic sort of uh, signifies this, but then this becomes much more clear towards the end of the doctrine of being, where we go through quality, quantity, and measure, and we see that none of these ways of immediate being are sustainable. So for this, another logic is needed, the logic of essence. The sphere of essence is the strange middle section of the mountain, and this middle section is itself subdivided into three. To cut a long story short, First, we understand being to be something completely different to essence. What is essential is not, per definition, something immediate. Secondly, if what is essential is forever divorced from immediate being, then it is not anything at all, because in this sense, it never is. And so what is essential turns out to be unessential according to its own lights. Here, Hegel does a revolution of traditional metaphysics by showing that what is genuinely essential is what has being, leading to his declaration that essence must appear. So we understand that essence appears in being, but this leads us to a two-fold or a two-world dichotomy. Um, since essence still has some remnant of itself apart from from being. The solution is in the problem. So, if essence appears in being, then there must be some essential relation between the two that guarantees that they are not wholly apart. Indeed, what is inner is inner because of the outer. And we adjust our understanding just a little. It is not so much is it it is not so much essence that appears in being but being that is the manifestation of essence. Okay? The process is thus not apart from what it instantiates. This is the third layer of essence, actuality or actual being. It is this far up in the mountain that Hegel finally begins to speak about necessity. But first, actuality. Whenever we understand that whatever inner is connected to something outer, we instantiate the category actuality. Because presupposed in this relation of inner and outer is a structure common to both. 
So when the gazelle demonstrates its cunning by instantiating its giant leap, it brings into being a clever process, which conversely it itself takes part of and is the beneficiary. The gazelle thus manifests a process, and the process becomes intelligible in its very manifestation in being, namely, as stotting, this peculiar activity gazelles do. But why can we not just stop there? The gazelle performs a smart action, but why not leave it to chance and contingency, like a singular event? I think Hegel and Dennett will want to say that inasmuch as it is a smart action, there is reason behind it and, bluntly put, reason to repeat it. Our stomachs don't digest once, but keep repeating the process because it's, and keeps you know, uh, refining it and making it better, as it sustains an activity we colloquially call being alive, just as the giant leap by the gazelle literally saves its life. The fact that such, such actions are repeatable and there are reasons to do them suggests something more at work in actual being. Indeed, Hegel calls this possibility and leads him to declare what is actual is possible. We see then that actuality puts the emphasis on being, what is instantiated immediately, and conversely, possibility emphasizes the essence the mediating process. But because we have developed now past two-world dichotomy, this difference is mis needs to be thought as internal to the actual being as such. This means, in turn, that possibility is not unrestricted, but bound up with its actual counterpart. Now, Hegel does give pure possibility its due uh, elsewhere, but shows exactly that such sheer possibility just like logical possibility, absolutely contradicts itself. So, the possibility we're dealing with here is to be grasped as real possibility. But it is not enough to simply connect actuality and possibility. If we equalize the two as simply reflections of one another, we get the category contingency. The contingency for Hegel simply determines that Whatever is the case is equally possible as it is actual. We thus find ourselves in an ambiguity where we cannot definitively cross the threshold from one to the other. Real possibility, on the other hand, is not ambiguous, but specifies a necessity. So, we have three elements on the table here. Actuality as the active identity of being in essence of the inner and outer. Contingency, or mere logical possibility, the ambiguity of the actual and the possible. And real, third, real possibility, as necessity or the unity of actuality and necessity. So beginning with the first point, the identity of inner and outer, of which actuality is made up of, does not collapse into a static identity since the moments are retained. And so we should think of actuality here as an efficacious relation or an activity. And I think this also, by the way, maps onto um, Aristotle's notion of actuality as an agea. So with regards to the second point, Hegel writes that the, conti that the contingent and possible depend on the content. So Hegel speaks here of positing, and the point is rather complicated, but I think that the insight is in the fact that the contingent depends on another. So the con when we determine something con as contingent, it adds something more than what is immediately there. Such that ambiguity is a further development from what is simply and immediately existent. And it presupposes a mediation. The contingent is made up of two moments actual and possible, and the moment of actuality maps onto the external immediate being of actuality, whereas the moment of possibility maps onto the mediation through another. And it is, and in this latter sense, is rendered a condition. So contingency here is the double determination of showing that the actual being is something external and independent, 
as well as a possible moment of another, and indeed many others. For example, the materials that make up a house, you know, wood, stone, etc., the trees, blah blah, initially exist independently without any intrinsic relationship to one another. However, in being brought together in as the house, it excludes their possibility in being a castle, a boat, a wall, furniture, and a variety of other things. However, logically, their possible condition for being these other things is still there, even when they are assembled in the house. The third point, then, shows how real possibility, or necessity, is dependent on the above conditions for its outcome. But it does not determine the conditions, only the outcome once the conditions are there. So there are two things going on here. First, there is a content, namely the outcome, that necessity brings into being, based on certain conditions. Second, the necessity has no control over the conditions directly, but must wait until they are gathered together to be activated. So the second thing makes it so that necessity is here relative to what is contingent. Right? The gazelle does not discover that it could do its cunning leap if there were no predators to escape from. In fact, in this scenario, the content here is the stotting, while the gazelle and the lion and their close proximity become the conditions. Hegel uses the example of a revolution, where the pre-revolutionary state and the post-revolutionary state are both moments of the content revolution. Once, the, in the pre, once like the pre-revolutionary conditions obtain, the revolution, by necessity, begins its activity, which brings about its content by transforming one set of actuality into another. And so, there is a fourth element around which all the three prior moments revolve around and mutually coordinate, and that is the content, or what Hegel calls the matter at hand, the Sache. This is a term notoriously difficult to translate. Um, so, the Sache can also, uh, you can also think of it as the case or the subject matter, right? It is whatever we are dealing, the term, the thing we're dealing with, okay? So, the matter at hand is intentionally left vague and something purely negative, since logically we do not know what it is until it's actualized. Do not discover that the, that the gazelle leap until the gazelle actually leaps. And yet, the matter is not something simply contingent or arbitrary, but a determinate and intelligible act grounded in actual conditions. So, Hegel needs to combine both the fact that what is rational must take place on takes must take on board actualities and contingencies, and that it has a necessary logic of its own with a distinct and unique character. So, in other words, the matter at hand is both something singular and general. That it actually happens or exists and has a generalizable rational character. So, what is necessary relates to the contingent we we have both generality and existence. Why can we not just stop here? Well, notice, the, gen the necessity we have thus far considered is only that necessity which is relative to the conditions and, contingency, and contingency. And so it turns this necessity into something one-sided, and itself, in fact, contingent upon the conditions. But we see that it is not the conditions that determine the matter at hand. So it's not the lion that determines the stotting by the gazelle, but the matter at hand which determines itself by transforming the contingencies into its conditions. It is the gazelle that determines itself further by taking the predator as its conditions and inaugurating the stotting leap. So, it's not the con no, put this in another way, it's not the conditions that are doing the determining. It is what 
takes the um, conditions, it takes the other as its other contingencies as its conditions. So the emphasis of what is determining or being or doing the determining is on um, the conditioned. Right? Hegel also makes this point in the logic of condition earlier in essence. But here we get a stronger sense that it revolves around a distinct individual. Although we're not there yet. So, the necessity that works through its contingent conditions is not relative to them as something outside them, but integrates them as moments of its development. The aforementioned relative necessity here becomes itself a momentary procedure of this richer sense of necessity, absolute necessity. And, moreover, contingency here does not drop out of the picture, but is vindicated as the immediate externality of an absolute process, absolutely necessary process. It is because there are beings which enact a content particular to them that this because becomes something opaque, seemingly contingent to others. In other words, contingency is an outward effect of an inner self-determination. The lion hunts the gazelle since it is the manifestation of the content predator, which takes as conditions a deadly arsenal of might, stealth, force, sharp claws, and ability to spot prey, and so on. This sense of absolute necessity thus incorporates the prior modal developments as three logical moments of itself. First, the power to shape conditions. Secondly, being the manifestation of a particular content or matter at hand. And third, the activity that has its locus in and through an individual which does the work of translating or negating one into the other. And with the third point, we return back to actuality again, as the efficacious activity we started out with. We see how Hegel combines individuals in generality and shows that one is not without the other, or indeed that general that generality owes its existence to individuals, and individuals are the beneficiaries of distinguishable characteristics pertaining to a free-floating rationality, as Dennett would put it. So, we see here that, even in absolute necessity, or more precisely, because of it, the individual and its content are still at the behest of the circumstances. It is the immediate actuality that logically comes first, and the rational content needs to tear itself through the jungle of contingency. Hegel even calls this violence, as something else needs to impinge upon the individual for the content to reveal itself. Nature loves to hide, as Heraclitus says. And only through the encounter of something seemingly alien does rationality of what is manifest itself. But, as Hegel writes, freedom is the understanding that what appears and relates to us from the outside is fundamentally not alien to us, but actually, at a foundational level, identical with us. What could he mean? So, one of Hegel's examples here is the relation of crime and punishment. We might normally think that someone who commits a uh, crime breaks the law, and then the law responds by punishing the wrongdoer. And for the wrongdoer, the law then appears in an impingement on their freedom. After all, they denied the law in their act, and so the law seems like something that only applies to other people. But, Hegel goes on to say, the wrongdoer has the right to be punished, as the punishment is a function that follows his crime. Quote, in being punished, the criminal is set free. End of quote. The key here is that the wrongdoer attains the consciousness that they and the law are not, in truth, in opposition, and this is what the punishment is meant to convey. So, if it does not, it fails to be punishment proper, and the law does not live up to its concept. So we might have a defunct law going on here. But this is like in a, an, an ideal scenario. Another example Hegel draws on is the ancient Greek tragic heroes. The tragic hero 
attempts to alter the order to their benefit or to their inner necessity, but is met with a violent end. Hegel writes, Hegel writes that these heroes accept their fate with serenity, and that this steely commitment to their violent faith and to their character is for us something awe-inspiring. We can think here about Oedipus and even Macbeth, whose ambition drives him against the established order. These characters have no need for consolation, and indeed consolation would be something detrimental to their character. Like Macbeth would stop being Macbeth if he um, found that he would need con consolation. Same with Oedipus. And indeed, Hegel writes, the immersion of these characters to their situation is actually something lower or cruder than consolation. They follow blindly the path of necessity, the path that necessity has laid out for them. Consolation, therefore, actually stands higher than the steadfast serenity of tragic characters, since it enables the character to transcend their circumstances and yet be in their negation. In losing their life, or their character, they gain it. Raskolnikov, the protagonist of Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment, gives in to consolation at the very end, and through this act transforms his fate. He ceases being a merely tragic character and becomes a comedic hero. He set, sets himself free. Notice that this, isn't, this doesn't erase or um, you know, pretend that you know, the crime and the punishment didn't happen, but it also doesn't, um, shows that he doesn't just give in to the situation that is given to him, both with regards to his own ambition and how that ambition um, dri drives him into conflict with society. So, in our gazelle and lion example, there is no real way for the gazelle to truly uh, come to terms with its circumstances, but remains ensnared in a perpetual war with the predator, even though it is implicitly self-determining. Human beings, concept-mongering creatures that we are, can come to understand our circumstances and see how circumstances of necessity come to define who we are. Indeed, we also grasp the circumstances of others around us and how it, uh, uh, um, circumstances of others around us, how it is plants photosynthesize, how planets go around orbit, uh, around the sun, and how we can craft instruments that make beautiful sounds or see gazelle doing cool cunning tricks. In this, we conceptualize the content of the situation and understand how it determines the individuals. But once this step is made, we effectively begin to determine ourselves. Our very distinguishing, um, or like our very understanding, puts us in touch with rationality anywhere and allows us to see the other not as mere other, but as our neighborly negative. So the content, or the matter at hand, of which I spoke above, is now rendered more precisely as the concept. So, you know, I began today talking about being and thought, how the two positions in philosophy try to mediate their identity and difference. In Hegel's story, the two cannot collapse into a shared identity, nor can they be wholly independent. So what seems to do justice to them, if I understand Hegel rightly, is that thought is the first negation of being, as essence, but that thought then must negate this negation, so becoming the concept such that thought grasps its comprehension in being a return to itself in the thing. What happens here to necessity then? Well, necessity is not lost, but it is understood, and in being understood it is thus redeemed. This is the dynamic of concept and freedom, and of, generally of idealism in general. So, the spirited movement that gives itself to itself in its other. Lowering itself to elevate others. So, thus we've made it to the peak of the mountain, actually. 
It is the concept. But where do we go from here? What about the heavens? The spheres beyond? What conceptual thinking prompts us to do is not to give chase to new heights far beyond, but to turn around and observe the path we have already traversed and to make sense of the wholeness of it, and in this way grasp the journey and the destination as one development. And in this sense, Hegel is really the philosopher of history, right? So we see here, we haven't spoken so much about history in a, in a temporal manner, but we have spoken of logical development, which is such that the result has to incorporate the moments of which it had gone through in order to become the result that it is. Okay, hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, any more questions and thoughts and uh, ideas for improvement, just put them in the comments below. Thank you very much.